All right, here we are. We're in John chapter 6. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're going to look at verses uh, 60 through 71. I'm going to be sharing today uh, a message that, that I believe uh, is needed at this moment for some, for some. And uh, for the rest of you, um, it may be in the future needed. So let's look at this together, beginning at verse 60 in John chapter 6. And therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man? ascend where he was before. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew, the, knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father." From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve and one of you is the devil. And he spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. And so in chapter 6, let me give you some information that leads up to what we'll be looking at today in verses 60 through 71. In chapter 6, John records that Jesus had performed a, uh, uh, an incredible miracle. He had fed a multitude of 5,000, and he had done so with five barley loaves and two small fish. Uh, the miracle had caused some to say that Jesus was that prophet spoken of by Moses. And because they were saying this, people wanted to take Jesus by force in order to make him a king. And so that caused the Lord to, to leave the area, and he went to a place called Capernaum. Well, the next day, a crowd followed him to the city, and he began to instruct them. And as he was sharing with them, he began making some incredible claims. And the claims were intended to separate genuine disciples from casual admirers. You see, when the Lord very often would say something, the person who was just a casual person, who really had no spiritual hunger or desire or interest, well, that person would hear what he had to say, and it would just cause it caused them to just walk away saying, I don't need this kind of thing at all. But somebody who had spiritual hunger when they would hear Jesus speak would want to pursue more. They'd want to know more about him. And so the sayings of Christ very often are intended to separate lazy listeners from sincere followers. And so he was making some very exclusive claims. And as he was teaching, he was challenging people to surrender to him, to fully commit themselves to him, And you can see it in some of the things he was saying. I'll read some of the verses in chapter 6 to show you what kinds of things he was saying. For example, in verse 35 of chapter, chapter 6, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. In verse 40, this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up. On the last day. Verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I will raise him up the last day. Verse 47. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. And then finally, verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood is eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. When you say things like that, I mean, those are incredible things to say. He's saying that you need to believe in me, trust in me, and 
You need to eat my flesh, drink my blood. You're going to have life within you. Well, that caused them to, to become very agitated and all. He was challenging them. You need to surrender to me. But they were offended. They were stumbled by his words and his claims. The, the scripture here speaks concerning, in verse 60, many of his disciples. Notice that word, disciples. That word disciple is used in the wider sense here, speaking of those who had been listening to and were in, intellectually accepting his teachings. Now, these would be regarded as followers, but they were not fully committed to him. And so their response in verse 60 is that they say, uh, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? The word hard is translated uh, rough or intolerable. It's unacceptable. It's offensive. The word saying speaks of the message. This is an unacceptable, offensive, intolerable message that he's giving. And when they say who can understand, the word understand means to comprehend, to perceive. So this is hard to hear is what they're saying. We don't understand this and we are rejecting what Jesus is saying. They're saying, who can digest this kind of teaching? Who can receive this kind of message? Now, this is a message that is difficult to truly believe. So who can digest this? Who can believe that this man is greater than Moses? Who can believe that he'll raise the dead? Who can believe that he's the bread from heaven? And to have life means to partake fully in him. Now, one of the things as I was beginning this message and introducing it, uh, we need as Christians to remember that, that Jesus never watered down his message. We live in a day when there are quite a number of, of teachers, quote unquote, who water the message down, who want to make it easy to digest to the point where they, they actually take out from it its heart. And so we want everybody to accept this and show up in church is, is really for a lot of pastors the goal. We want to have a lot of people in our, in our pews. We want the place filled with people. And so I'll say, th say things that they want to hear. I'll say the things that they'll come back to hear more of. And, and um, Jesus never did that. And Jesus was saying things, and you need to read your Bibles and to see this, but Jesus was saying things that were, as they're saying, difficult, hard to understand. These are things that we're rejecting. They're intolerable. We can't believe this. To say he's the bread of life. To say that you have to believe in him and he'll raise you up. To say that the Father will draw you through him. To say that, that uh, you have to believe to have that life because he's the living bread. That doesn't make sense. And so they were offended. Jesus' words don't always unite people. Keep that in mind, because when you actually go through the Bible, his words divide people. And Jesus made it clear in Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to divide. My words will divide, and that's what Christ is saying. So we shouldn't be surprised when people are offended when you actually share the truth with them. You shouldn't be, uh, you know, weirded out or, or even, you know, concerned. Not to say that you shouldn't care about how people feel. We should all show compassion and concern for others. But don't be surprised when you say, but Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life, like we were looking at recently. Don't be surprised when, when people say, well, that's why I don't like Christianity. That's why I don't like people like you, because you guys are, are, are so rejecting and so hateful. And don't be surprised at that. Very often when people would hear Christ, they would become upset at what he said. In Matthew 13, in verses 54 through 58, Matthew writes, When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And so Christ actually became a stumbling block to people. His words were offensive. You see, if the message was watered down, though, I wouldn't have come to faith in Christ. If the message was a feel-good message, 
I wouldn't have come to faith in the Lord because if you're telling me I'm okay the way that I am, I knew I wasn't. If you said everything was going to turn out all right to me, I knew it wasn't. If you said the things that I was doing was okay with God, I knew they weren't. So when somebody said, listen, you're lost and you need of God, you need to be forgiven, your heart is hard, you're going in the wrong direction, well, that's the word of the gospel. I didn't want a watered-down message because I wouldn't have come to faith in Christ. And neither would my parents. My parents would not have come to Christ either. Neither would my, my sister Becky or my sister Madeline. They would not have come to faith in the Lord. They needed the truth spoken to them with love. And so this is what's taking place. He's been teaching these things. And, and in verse 60, once again, those people who were listening said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? So when it says he knew in himself, his disciples murmured, that would speak of his spiritual awareness, not that he was listening to them, but he was aware of what was going on. He was aware of their difficulties. He knew what was going on inside of them. So he says, does this offend you? Does it offend you because I speak of myself as the bread of life? Are you stumbled? of what I'm telling you and what you need. And so that's what's taking, a pla taking place there. Does this offend you? Verse 62, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? So Jesus referred to the fact that he had come down from heaven. So he's saying, will my ascension prove beyond a, a shadow of a doubt that I came down from heaven? And then he says in verse 63, it's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And so physical food will feed my flesh, but it doesn't nourish my spirit. Jesus' spiritual words satisfies spiritual hunger. So his words need to be seen as spiritual in nature. A literal interpretation will not yield spiritual insights. It's like when Nicodemus, as recorded in, in chapter 3 of John's Gospel, this rabbi, a very famous teacher, a premier teacher in Israel, had come to Christ by night. And you remember that story where Nicodemus had spoken to him and said, Master, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do the works that you do unless God is with him. So he began speaking first and foremost as a man who was a teacher who also was in fellowship with other great teachers. And and he was speaking concerning his group. And they had come to a consensus that Jesus Christ obviously was from heaven. So he came and said that to him, Master, we, my group, and I know that you are a teacher, come from heaven. No man can do the works that you do unless God is with him. In other words, we, we've listened to what you've said, your claims, but we've also seen your power. And we know that this is not of earthly origin. And therefore, we have together decided that you are come from God. And Jesus didn't say, isn't that cool? He didn't say, well, you know, I've got some greater things. Hang around, Nick, and you'll see more. He said, um, unless a man is born again, he cannot see or enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, what are you talking about, born again? What do you, what do you mean, Nicodemus' response was? What do you mean, born again? How is it possible for a man to be born again? Is he to enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born again in that natural way? So he actually, as a teacher, is asking a question, Jesus says to him, the words that he is speaking are spiritual in nature. You can't take these words in a literal way. You need to be born from above. And that's how some people are, is they, they hear what he's, he's saying, and they just kind of take them in a literal sense, in a wooden sense, if you will. And Jesus is saying, no, it's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit, and they're alive. They are spiritual in nature. You'd have to have a spiritual hunger. The Holy Spirit has to work through these in order for you to be able to receive those things that'll transform you. There's, there's, there's faith and belief and reception that's all involved if you're going to have a transformed life. It's like when Paul was writing to the Corinthians and he had said, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, neither can he know them for they are spiritually discerned. The natural man, speaking of the unregenerate man, the man who hasn't been born again, he says the natural man doesn't receive. That word receive means to welcome, accept. The natural, the unborn again man, the non-spiritual man, doesn't welcome in the things of the spirit. Why? Because there's foolishness. The word foolishness in the original language means they, they make no sense. It's moronic. It's imbecilic. 
because a man thinking in a natural way cannot understand the things of the Spirit. So it takes the Holy Spirit to convict a person of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It takes the Holy Spirit to enter into a person's life to take God's words and when mixed with faith to transform those into things understandable by that person so that they can have a relationship with God and move on in the life of the Spirit. And so Jesus is speaking to people here who can't understand. And so he says, this will offend you. <clears throat> Excuse me. What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? <clears throat> and he explains it. It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. They are life. And so some things can only be understood through the lens of faith. And again, these hard sayings eliminated the lazy, fair-weather disciples. The fact is, some people are just not hungry for the bread of life. That's in church as well as the world. Some people just don't hunger for the Word of God. A lot of people uh, know uh, what's on TV and plots and movies and various books much better than they know their Bibles because they really don't have a hunger for the things of God. In Jeremiah 15, verse 16, said it like this. Jeremiah the prophet said, Your words were found, I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord of hosts. And so Jeremiah was saying, I, I discovered your word. I found your word and I consumed it because that causes joy in my life. And that's the, the mark of a believer. That's the mark of somebody who loves the Lord. Well, verse 64 says, there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. This is true whenever people gather together. Some claiming to be disciples don't believe him. They don't. They can hear him. They can repeat him. Sometimes they'll know all kinds of information. And I've seen this over the years where, where many who profess to be Christians have no hunger or understanding of the Word of God. They just don't need it. They just don't want it. it. It doesn't appeal to them for whatever reason. Maybe it's not saying the things they want it to say. I don't know. Maybe it's said in a way where they don't appreciate the way it seems to have been said. I really don't know. All I know is there are people who go to church just like this one who don't want to hear, have no desire, happen to be there, will find some place else to go someday. That's just what they do. They're not hungry. There's no hunger in, the, the hunger in them. They're not like Jeremiah saying, your words are found, and I hate them. I consume them. They, they gave me life. They gave me joy. That's not true with everybody. Many claim to follow Christ, but only those who trust him are, their is, are his disciples. And again in verse 64, he knew from the beginning who they were who didn't believe. He knew that they did not believe as a group. But he also knew that Judas was rejecting. He knew that Judas did not follow him. And so in verse 65, he said, Therefore, I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my Father. We cannot come to Christ unless the Father draws us by his Spirit. If the soil is not prepared to receive the seed, no effort on the part of the farmer will make that soil receptive. And so with all of this that's being said, notice this is taking place. Verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Now, according to verse 59, he said these things as he taught in a, in a synagogue in the city of Capernaum. I want to now bring this to a place of application as we look at this passage together. I want you to put yourself for just a moment, put yourself in the synagogue. You're, you're there, and the place is packed out. Remember, the day before, Jesus had fed 5,000 men, not including women and children. He had left, and the people came looking for him and couldn't find him. They got in little boats and went up in the Sea of Galilee, they went up to the north in the center to this village called Capernaum. And they got off of their boats and they walked up. And you can do that kind of thing to this day. You can arrive at the shoreline and, 
You can walk on up. And they walked up into the city of Capernaum. They walked up to the synagogue. And Jesus was in there teaching, so they entered in. And so this small building was packed with people. And as Jesus is there seeing them and ministering and giving them this message, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. I will raise them up at the last day. And he's saying these things. They're watching this rabbi. And as they're watching him speak, they're thinking within themselves, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? This isn't the same as eating those fish burgers that we had yesterday. This is different. He's making demands on us. We like the idea of somebody who could supply our physical needs. Whenever we're hungry, he'll give us food. We like that. Because Jesus earlier had addressed that. He said, you're following me not because of what I said, but because I fed you and you were no longer hungry. You're coming for physical food, but you don't understand your spiritual need. You want me to give you physical things, but you don't want the spiritual things that come with me. You don't want that. And he challenged them. He would offend them. He stumbled them. He said things directly to them because they needed to hear things directly. Some things need to be said plainly. When my girls were, were young girls and some boy wanted to take them out, if I didn't feel good about it, I would say so. I'm their dad. I have the responsibility to rain on their parade. I have the responsibility of making their lives miserable. That's my job description. But if I knew the guy was just not the right sort of guy for him, what kind of father would I have been to not be honest with them? You have to be honest with them, lovingly honest. Do they always like hearing the truth? No, of course not. No, why? Because they've made up their mind that they know what they need. But I have a different perspective, and I would say the truth to them. Guess what? Some people don't like the truth. Say to us pleasant things. Say to us things we want to hear. But don't tell us difficult things. Don't tell us hard things. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet is given a message, and God speaks to Ezekiel, and he says to him, my, he says, the people come before you, and they sit before you as if they're my people, but they're not my people. He says, you to them have become like a man with a pleasant singing voice who plays skillfully on a guitar. And so they say to their friends, come and hear what the man of God has to say. And they come and they sit before you. They sit before you as if they're my people. But they are not my people, God told Ezekiel, because they hear and they will not do. And that's how it is. Oh, yeah, I love the Lord. I love his word. I love to worship. Oh, I love those things. But when the word goes out and cuts the heart, that's when we know whether we really have a relationship with him. When it's not easy to do what he's saying, when it has a cost, and when there are choices that are made. I, I can't tell you. Listen, you know, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I have obviously this thing with my throat, but uh, let me tell you, I've been at it for 48 years as a Christian. I, I've been teaching the Word of God since September of, of 1973. 45 years. I have seen hundreds into the thousands as I have ministered over the years. I've spoken to men, 8,000, 9,000 men at a time. Same message, same thing. This is what we need to do for years and years and years, radio ministry that reached into the hundreds of thousands, many people getting saved and many people rejecting. And there are a lot of people who will come and a lot of people will say, oh, come and hear what the word of God is today. But God said, but, but Ezekiel, they come and they sit before you as if they're my people, but they're not. Well, what do you mean they're not, Lord? What do you mean they're not? They're not because they hear and they won't do. Because they listen, but they don't with their heart. They listen, but they're not. They like your voice. They like the way you do it. Oh, yeah, you got to hear this guy. This guy here really says it the way it is. But in fact, they're not interested. They're not. They're not. You know why? Because it's not being said the way they want to hear it. They want to smile. They want to laugh. Now, that's not, there's nothing wrong with either one of those two. But what you got to see yourself in the context here. Jesus is in a synagogue. These people were fed. They got what they wanted. 
They want more of it. Let's make him a king because he can give us things that we don't have to work for. He'll just give us food. And that's what Jesus said. You're following not because of what I was saying, but because I fed you. He was clear about that. He wasn't there to feed their bellies. He was there to feed their souls. But because they listened and he made those claims, they began to filter out. Every time I teach, someone filters out. Every time. Every time. Sometimes they slam doors just to let me know how mature they are when they go. They do that. They do that. I've been doing this for years. I've seen hundreds, hundreds. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that. Give me pleasant words. Give me sweet words. Make me feel good about myself. Well, sometimes you need to see what you are before you can see what you can become. I needed to see myself as a lost, miserable sinner because that's what I was, a doper, a druggie, an evil man. And I had to see myself for that before I could go to the physician who could make me well. So truth sometimes is hard. It can be difficult to hear, but it sets you free. And that's what Jesus said. You will know the truth. It'll set you free. And so picture in your mind's eye these people just filtering out. There was a packed hall, and Jesus is watching them, and his boys are with them. And he's watching them as they're walking out. Verse 66 again, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They walked away. And as Jesus watches the people flow out of the synagogue, rejecting him, he looks at his apostles, and he asks them the most important question that he could ask. And notice his question in verse 67. And this is where we're going to rest for a while, at the common question. Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? Do you also want to go away? Have I not met your expectations also? Now this question is asked with the anticipation of them saying, of course not. But still, they need to look deeply within themselves. They need to test themselves. Has Jesus stepped over a line? Should I stay with him or should I turn away? Now, I am thoroughly convinced that mature believers will be asked this question. And I say mature believers. The Lord Jesus doesn't necessarily have to ask a backslider, do you want to go away? Because they already have chosen to step away from him. He doesn't have to ask a lukewarm person because that person's not doing anything to follow him anyway. That's not a question you're going to hear a lukewarmer uh, receive. It's the one who's been serving God. It's the one who's been following him. It's like his disciples who had said, we've given up everything to follow you. We left family. We left friends. We left our business. We left everything behind. We began to follow an itinerant rabbi, somebody that, that is not really popular now. We decided to do that, to come and follow you. When it, when it costs, it costs us everything. We, we are people who want to serve you. I'm, I hope I'm speaking to some in this room right now who are of that stripe who have said, my old life is gone. I want to pursue the Lord with all of my heart. I hope there are some people in this room right now who are saying to, to, within themselves, I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to follow Christ no matter what the cost because that's the person who's going to have this question asked. This question is something that is asked of those who have said, I've left all to follow you. I'm going to follow you with all of my heart. I, I'm, I, was, I hated my life. I hated what I was. I hated what I did to other people. I, I hated the, the aimlessness of my life. I hated the fact that, that I, I, I just was mean and I was, I was ruthless. I was a liar, a deceiver. I, I hated those things about me. Those things that I hated, I continued to do until you set me free. And there's got to be people in this room like that where the Lord touched you one day and when the Lord said to you, I will set you free, I will make you new. And you said, God, I'm going to follow you no matter what. And you lost your friends and you lost family members and, and, and things became harder on the job and, or in the school or whatever. You became that freak that people didn't want to spend time with. That's what happened to me. That's what happened to me. All my friends are gone. It's a new life. I'm starting from scratch. And that's Christianity. That's how it works. 
I'm thoroughly convinced that mature believers will be asked this question, do you also want to go away? And so I want to speak to you today. I want to share with you that spiritual depth does not come easily, and spiritual depth does not come without a great price. And remember that faith will always be refined. In Job 23, 10 through 12, Job said, He knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. And this is coming from the mouth of Job who was suffering with wounds on his body and the disrespect of his friends and the taunting of children. He became the song of children, taunting and ridiculing. And yet what is he saying? I remained faithful. He tested me. I'll come forth as gold. My feet fall closely followed him. I kept to his way. I haven't departed. I treasure the words of his mouth. And this is what I got for it. You ever been there? You ever been there? And this is what I got for it? I lost my friends. I lost my family. I lost my dignity. I lost everything. When I was a doper and a, a drunk, everybody that I knew kind of liked me because I was the clown. I was the life of the party. And when I got sober and started living a sober life, now what happened to you? You used to be fun. Look at you. What happened to you? And I would say, I was your clown, but now I'm not. Now I'm a servant of Christ. I have dignity now. I don't need your attention. I need his. And that's how I was. That's what I became like. I said, I'm not going to be what I was. I'm going to be brand new because Jesus makes all things new. And he made me new. But that's what happens. And so you decide, I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to be his person. Well, we need to remember that God demands total devotion, not half-hearted curiosity. And we need to remember that total vulnerability leaves you open to hurt and disappointment. And you can even become hurt and disappointed with the way it seems that God is treating you. Remember that it's possible to love the Lord but not understand His ways because life events and circumstances can lead to the question, do you want to go away? Believers, as they grow, come to understand that afflictions are part of the Christian life. They're part of how God shapes us into the person He intends us to become. It's part of how God conforms us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. Have you learned that in hard times, you're more sensitive to the presence of God? Is it not true that when you're under pressure, you pray more fervently and more often? It's in the difficult times that we start searching the scriptures to find answers to our problems. It's through difficult times and seasons that we are being refined. Like it says in Psalm 119, verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Charles Spurgeon once said, if we would be scholars, we must be sufferers. God's commands are best read by eyes wet with tears. And that's true. I'll give you a brief testimony, if I may. Please don't, Pastor. No, I'm going to. I was 23 years old when I began ministering the Word of God, September of 1973. In September of 1974, I began a Bible study in Ontario, and over time, we planted our first church there. As long as I can remember, I've been blessed with good health. I had my appendix removed. I broke my wrist. I broke an ankle. I have had hepatitis, but over the years, I never really went through anything that was very serious. It all changed in early 2001. I experienced an episode of temporary amnesia, but at that time it didn't cause that much concern. In September of 2008, while in Florida, I lost my memory. I was hospitalized for three days. I was giving a, a Bible study, and, and as I was teaching, I went into a amnesia. 
I was able to read, but that was it. I remember giving an invitation. People came forward. That should happen more often. But people came forward. I went down and I spoke to some people, but I didn't know where I was, and I was just operating in a, in a way of just like the momentum was there. But my wife, Marie, knew I had lost my memory. She'd seen it happen more than once. I still can remember her coming and standing next to me, and I took her by the arm, and I pulled her next to me, and I whispered, I don't know where I'm at. You need to get me out of here. So she did. They took me to the back. A paramedic came, hooked me up with a blood pressure. It was 270. They said, this man's going to have a stroke. They took me to a hospital, put me in a bed, and I woke up at like 1 or 2 in the morning. I had no idea where I was, but my wife was laying in a cot next to me. That's all I remember. And they kept me there for three days. And because they were so concerned about me, they had me go through medical examinations. Again, this is in September of 2008. I took a PET scan, an EEG, an EKG, EKG, and there was damage that was found to my front, left, and right temporal lobes that was caused by uh, calcification. And so they showed me the x-rays. They said, there's calcification. Your brain is dying. So we have to send you to specialists to see what can be done. So they sent me to a psychologist, neurologist. They tested my memory. Again, this was in 2008. And uh, as I was speaking to the doctor, she said to me, you have dementia, the onset of dementia. And I said, okay. I said, be brutally honest and say things to me that are real and even frightening if necessary. Because if you don't give me any, anything that causes any concern, I have to be honest with you, I'll do nothing. She said, okay, here's the brutal truth. You will be in a full state of dementia in seven years. If you don't change some of the things you're doing, I can't say anything any better than that. So I looked at her, and I turned to my wife, Marie, who was seated next to me, and I say to Marie, I'm going to go to the car. Can you take care of the rest of this for us? And I went, and has anybody here ever done that 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock thing with your steering wheel where you kind of sit behind it and you just do this? You ever do that? Some of us have. I sat there with here. I sat like this. I sat there looking out the window. I still remember looking out the window going, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You see, a minister's whole ministry is his memory. And to lose my memory, I lose everything. And I sat there holding on to the steering wheel. And Marie came walking out, and she was ash, and her little face was, and she sits next to me, doesn't know what to say. And I looked at her, okay, honey, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so we had a scheduled trip to go to Hawaii with the church and getting ready to go. The doctor who had taken the scans and all said, you need to come in. And I told Marie, I'm not going in. I'm going to Hawaii. <laughs> Might as well. So I did. And I got home from Hawaii. And we made our appointment and we went in. And so the doctor says to me, you know, sometimes we make mistakes. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong. You're okay. And I remember going, that's my God. God was kind to me. God was kind to me. And so I thought, well, bless the Lord. Thank you, Lord. And so Marie and I went out for dinner a couple days later, and while we were at Dinner, I got a phone call from my doctor, my general practitioner, and he said, uh, <laughs> he said, you have stage two diabetes. And I said, what kind of foods am I not supposed to eat? And he told me, and that was on my plate in front of me. I still remember that. I go, oh, no, I can't eat this. And so now I, I've been diagnosed with stage two diabetes. At the same time, I was having trouble with my vision. I had to go to an ophthalmologist. And he said, you're in the early stages of glaucoma and you're developing cataracts. I didn't know what glaucoma was. And if anybody here has been told you're getting 
developing it, deal with it quickly. I didn't. I didn't know what it was. I've lost 30% of my vision in my right eye, and I had cataracts formed in my right eye. They had to remove the cataracts. I have to take drops now. If I'd have known that you could take drops that would have saved me, I would have taken the drops. I was never told that. So I lost 30% of my vision. It's very difficult for me to, to see out of my right eye now. And that's why sometimes you'll see me looking like this. You may notice eventually I'm trying to wander here to see the words because I can't see very well out of my right eye. And so that took place. So a dermatologist, I have to go to see him. He said, you're in the early stages of skin cancer. So all of this took place between September and March of 2008. Without, within six months, I'm getting all of these diagnoses. At the same time, people begin to leave the church. They're inviting others to go with them. Eventually, one of my longtime staff members failed in ministry, crushed my heart. So it began to challenge me. I began to wonder if it's time to leave ministry. I wondered if my time here was over. Should I leave? Maybe there's something else for me to do. I began to seriously seek the Lord. I asked, what am I to do? Is it time for me to go? And it was, it was, a, it was a dark, dark time. Even to this day, let me, I'll be honest with you. I forgot to tell the first service because I have a bad memory, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I've been healed. No, um. I have to take a medicine now. I've been taking it that has changed the taste of food. And so, Marie and I had for many years the ritual of just getting a cup of coffee together. I don't drink coffee anymore because the medicine I take has taken away the taste of food. So, everything doesn't taste good anymore for me. And so, there are little things that were my life that are being taken away. Small things but important things, little things that my life was built on, my coffee time with my wife, things like that. What an uplifting message, huh? <laughs> I'm trying to be real with you guys. Common question. Do you want to go away? Do you want to go away? What am I to do, Lord? Well, I began to learn that the difficult times strip away the trivial things and exposes the eternal. You get a clearer vision. Your will is strengthened. Your faith is refined. As I said, that day that I heard the prognosis of dementia, I went and sat in my car he had, she had given me seven years. I began to think. I was 58. I was thinking, seven years? I'll be 65. I had hoped to be able to do some things and continue doing things. And, and now I'm thinking, I, I've got a seven-year time. And, and, and I, I told Maria, I said, listen, honey. I said, if the day ever comes where, where I cannot, I cannot. I can't recognize you. Put me in a home and let me be alone. I don't want you to see me like that. I don't want you to suffer. My wife said, I'll put you in a home right now. No, she said, <laughs> <laughs> that was her plan all along. She said, of course, I'll never leave you. I met and married you, and I'll stay with you. I said, I don't want you to go through this with me. That's where it got. The medicines I take, by the way, have a side effect of opening my emotions. Have you noticed that? <laughs> That's a fact. I'm not playing with you. I don't cry. You might find that interesting. I don't. It's not that I can't. It's just that I don't. Why would I? But when I open up like this and the medicines are kicking in, I'm being real. You know, it's hard to control the tears. Forgive me for those who are uncomfortable with it. But I just, it's hard to control because the medicines have a side effect. And that is it breaks down what I normally would be able to do. And it opens me up in a way I'm not comfortable with. 
but it's me, it's what I am. And I'm living with it. Some of you understand. Others, you wonder, why does that guy cry? Well, <laughs> I wonder too. But when I open up, it just does. Forgive me. Some of you are uncomfortable. But that's what I was going through. I began to ask myself, is my wife ready for me to leave? Are my children prepared? Have I been the best father, husband, grandfather that I could be? I began to think of my ministry. I had thought I'd be here for years. So I began to prepare my staff to handle the church if someday I can't. But it also helped me to answer the question, is it time for you to go away? Do you want to go away? My answer then is the same as it is now. No. I have nowhere to go. You have the words of eternal life. Many years ago when I was a young man in my early 20s, I went through a crisis of faith and I went through a very deep pit of despair, a sense of depression that I'd never experienced before. To the degree that I stopped leaving the home for a while, I started actually just staying in the house and, and I, would place my, I would sit on my bed with my back to the wall and my sister Madeline would s sit next to me and, and I couldn't even speak to anybody. I, I was weeping uncontrollably for days, for days. The depression hit me in such a severe way that I wasn't leaving the house except for necessities. And that, and it got so bad, and my, my sister Madeline would sit there and just cry with me. I couldn't speak to anybody. I'd never been in such a, a bad place. And I opened up the Bible. I opened it up to this passage here, and I began to read. And then the question Jesus said, do you also want to go away? I still remember reading it and closing the Bible. And I said, where can I go? And I spoke to the ceiling in my parents' house. And I said, where can I go? I have no friends. I gave up everything. I'm going to Bible college. I want to be a pastor. But I don't know what to do. I can't take it anymore. Father, you've got to do something. My heart is broken. There's a lot in my testimony that you guys don't know. But there's been a lot of hurt. And I opened the book up again, my Bible. Lord, to who, to who would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And I knew that that was the Lord speaking to me in a way that was recognizable and for that moment. And I started to cry and I said, God, forgive me. I haven't understood you. I have blamed you for my pain. And I know that even your wounds that you bring are intended to be healing. And I receive from you. And that's when my healing began. And that's when my journey into more ministry took place. So a long time ago, this question was asked of me. And I said, you are the Christ. You are the Son, a living God. Your word and the evidence of your work has caused me to believe in you. You are my Messiah. You are God's Son. I will follow you. And in that decision, there's no turning back. I have believed your promise. I will hold fast to you. Well, Jesus in verse 7, he says, did I not choose you, the 12, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the 12. Well, Peter had spoken out of turn. He had said, we have come to believe, and that would include Judas. But Jesus corrects him, huh, one of you is a devil. You're working on the side of Satan. Psalm 41, 9, 
Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. No, Peter, not every one of you has received my words of life. Judas rejected him. See, so I came to the point where I realized that I could receive or reject. The men received, Judas rejected. Which one was I going to be? I decided to land on the side of life, and I followed Christ. And I'm encouraging you today because, listen, this may not seem like a message that is upbeat because in many ways it's not, but it's real. A lot of you are going through tough times. A lot of you have gone through pain. A lot of you are right now probably hearing you want to give up. And I'm here today to tell you, don't. It gets better. God doesn't leave you. God doesn't forsake you. God loves you. God will heal you, and God will use you. That's what I'm here to tell you today. That's what I'm here to tell you today. Don't give up. Don't give up. Hold fast. It all turns out great. One of these days, you'll look in the eyes of Jesus Christ, and you will say, it was worth it. Every single thing was worth it. Thank you, Lord. And so I'll close with a poem. It's called The Race. It's about a young boy who had fallen three times during a race as his father was there watching him run. And this is called The Race. Defeat. He lay there silently, a tear dropped from his eye. There's no sense in running more. Three strikes, I'm out. Why try? The will to rise had disappeared. All hope had fled away. So far behind, so error-prone. A loser all the way. I've lost, so what's the use, he thought. I'll live with my disgrace. But then he thought about his dad, who soon would have, he'd have to face. Get up, an echo sounded low. Get up, take your place. You were not meant for failure here. Get up, win the race. With borrowed will, get up, it said. You haven't lost at all. For winning is no more than this, to rise each time you fall. So up he rose to run once more, and with a new commit, he resolved that win or lose, at least he wouldn't quit. So far behind the others now, the most he'd ever been, still he gave it all he had and ran as though to win. Three times he'd fallen, stumbling. Three times he'd rose again, too far behind to hope to win. He still ran to the end. They cheered the winning runner as he crossed the line, first place, head high and proud and happy, no falling, no disgrace. But when the fallen youngster crossed the line last place, the crowd gave him the greater cheer for finishing the race. Even though he came in last with bowed head low, unproud, you would have thought he won the race to listen to the crowd. And to his, uh, his dad, he sadly said, I didn't do so well. To me, you won, his father said. You rose each time you fell. And now... When things seem dark and hard and difficult to face, the memory of that little boy helps me to win my race. For all of life is like that race with ups and downs and all. And all you have to do to win is rise each time you fall. And with Jesus Christ, we can rise. And we will not not fall. We can rise.